Walker, Managing Partner of Smart Harbor, and I have joining me today our digital strategist, Patrick Laycock, and our topic of discussion is understanding your brand image and how it impacts your SEO. So before I get started, if you don't mind, I do have control on my side to mute everyone as they're coming in, but for whatever reason, sometimes the mute function might not apply. So if you don't mind on your end, on your phone, just pressing mute. That way we don't have any background noise as we're going through the presentation. Also, if you have specific questions um, about the topics of discussion, please make sure that you enter those into the chat feature that's being presented to you today by Fugent along with WebEx. And at the end of our presentation, we'll go through some Q&A, and then what we may not cover, um, you are always welcome to reach out to us one-to-one. Uh, -one. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Again, our topic is understanding your brand image and how it impacts your SEO. So just really quickly, Smart Harbor, just to give you our quick background, we empower growth and retention for approximately 1,100 insurance agencies today, uh, primarily on the independent side and providing marketing technology and counsel to all of our agency customers and partners. And with that being said, we have a lot of information and data, um, and so we're going to start bringing that into the mix of our presentation so that you're aware of in the universe of our agency, some of the trends that we're seeing, uh, some of the successes that we're experiencing with our agencies to be able to drive a good discussion and be working with a good sample of agencies that present detailed information. Uh, in 2018, you either read it, you've been getting commentary from um, some of our uh, agencies. Sorry, someone's telling me to step close to the mic, so I'm just going to do it. Um, <laughs> Probably read about trends in the digital space, or you have um, had calls from vendor partners and people that might be soliciting you all around what are the game changing trends in 2018 when it applies to digital marketing, specifically around search engine optimization, paid media, and then new entrants into the game when we think about voice search with all of these devices that we're now using within our homes and even our, our mobile phones um, being able to speak more semantically in order to find products, services locations that you're seeking around some of your interests. And so I'm just capturing up here on the screen that you can see some of the leading publications um, and thought leaders in the space that all have uh, some quick wins that you're able to implement from a, uh, an SEO perspective and a brand perspective. So today, thinking about some of those trends and putting our trends together as well, uh, we will discuss the following. Uh, we have five really kind of those tips, tricks, and we're going to apply that to some of the agency partners that we're working with and the results that we've been able to experience with our agency partners, but really focusing on what does it mean to integrate with link partners, enhancing community cues when we're thinking about social media and reviews online, uh, re reinforcing mobile usability, so it's probably no surprise to any one of us that more and more consumers are using their mobile devices in order to be able to perform searches and even uh, perform transactions, both in you know, the industry at large, but you can also focus that on the insurance space. Uh, producing quality content. So we're going to go a little bit deeper because you've, I'm sure, been pitched on or heard discussions around build out good quality content and they will come. It's not that easy, uh, but we do want to make sure that we dispel any uh, mysteries around the development of content and what it means in this new day and age where we have different devices that we're consuming that information. And then complying with security requirements. So we will specifically dive in a little bit more technical but extremely relevant um, SSL certificates on websites because major search engines, browsers, they're starting to enforce some rules around making sure that your site's secure and that obviously conveys what it needs to convey around your brand and we'll go into detail around that. And then we have one little uh, a, a piece that's growing, a topic that's growing, and again I've already alluded to it before, entering the world of voice search. And so the way that people are starting to get to your web properties, um, they're using specific devices that weren't around just a year or two ago, and so that is requiring um, us to think about search in a more semantic way, in a more intent-driven way, so we want to go into that as almost a, a little add-on to this discussion and presentation.
presentation. Again, before I start, I think some of you, even though I put a mass mute on all the phones, I heard someone clear their voice. Um, that's not your fault, but if you don't mind, just pressing mute on your phone so that you're muted, there's no background noise, and we can go through our presentation. All right, so integrating with link partners. And this is a specific actually we've grabbed from our 1,100 plus agencies. On average, creating local listings backlinks caused a 32.5% increase in overall traffic. And we here and most of uh, the players in this space um, and even thinking about you as agencies and then carrier partners, it's best to be able to objectify information so that we are leading from a point of example and something that might help drive um, production when it comes to ranking online and being able to drive visitors through a process. And so you'll see a common theme throughout whether we're presenting our information or third-party data. We always want to make sure that we are presenting information that can help to drive success on your web property. So again, this is something that we have pulled from our uh, group of agencies. And to really go more in detail around backlinks, I'm going to turn it over to Patrick Laycock. Patrick? Hey everybody, uh, yeah, my name is Patrick Laycock. For those of you who I uh, have not been in a webinar with or, or spoken to before, um, I'm a yeah, I'm a strategist here. I'm going to do a little bit of I guess color commentary here with Jason. <laughs> um, so when we talk about uh, looking at link partners and and developing backlinks, first thing I want to answer is uh, what what is a backlink um, because it's potentially vernacular that we use here in the digital space that not everybody knows about. So. Um, it simply put, is an incoming hyperlink from one website to another, specifically yours in this case. So anywhere, as I usually explain it, anywhere online that is linking to you, that link is a backlink. Um, and it, I gave you a couple little examples of what they look like here. You've got um, over on the left, that's a dual screenshot from Facebook, um, and then in the middle, is something from Yellow Pages, and then on the right is just a, another website, another essentially community website um, with an agency's website on there. And, and, and the middle one, you can see they aren't necessarily just a hyperlink. Um, it, can, it, it takes many forms, but any link that gets to you is a backlink. Um, and it's pretty crazy um, how important these still are. Google and other search engines go through these changes and these updates to, the, to their algorithms you know, monthly basically and these big sweeping changes every, you know, quarter, six months or so. But back in the in the dawning era of search engine, uh, this was one of the only ways that yeah, the search engines could kind of grade websites and, and rank them accordingly. So if you had a lot of backlinks, you were going to rank really high uh, whenever somebody searched for anything regarding your website. Um, it is even with all those updates that they have gone through, they are still in extremely important today. I've seen numbers even up to over half of the ranking algorithm goes into looking at your quality and your quantity of your backlinks. So well, I guess <laughs> next question, what does this have to do with my brand? So covered some basic, you know, why it's important to, to get your website to perform, but um, I believe this is, this is pretty important because your branding, we, we want to make sure that we talk about brand as not just what happens, like what you can control, what's on your website, what's on your, you know, online billboard. Um, and that's, you know, there's, there's many different types, right? So we have carrier backlinks. You can see that, that first point, making sure that your carriers are linked to you. If somebody's on your carrier page, for instance, maybe you're, I don't know, very, if you're into agriculture or something and you're on a, a carrier, uh, site that focuses more on agriculture insurance, you're going to be, it's, it's important for your brand to show up there so you appear as a trusted source. Um, social media, you focus on your community brand or maybe your professional brand, maybe you want to make sure that you're linked correctly on Facebook or LinkedIn. Um, and then your community organization, getting linked on, if you're involved with like a Kiwanis or a Rotary Club or um, I don't know, even, even as far as like uh, your local chambers, that can provide people with a, an idea of what you're about in your community. Um, so here's an example. This is how to create essentially a backlink in Google. Uh, there are probably a few of you in here that attended a uh, webinar a couple, maybe a month ago about, uh, about Google, so I'm not going to get crazy into how to, <laughs> but you can see here, you know, you, we up in the top right there, we create the backlink, we put in to this listing, this Google My Business listing, 
where this link needs to go. It's to your website. Uh, and then it generates itself right there on this, gen on this Google My Business profile. Click on website, takes you to the website. Um, that is as simple as creating a backlink can be. Uh, and as I, as I talked about before, there are, there are many different types of backlinks that we can kind of classify, especially in the insurance space, like carriers, listings, social media, community pages. Um, but this is an example of how to, how to create one. And then, uh, just to kind of prove out, as Jason was talking about, our, our methods, you can see here just some data behind this example, actually, of creating this Google backlink for this agency. Um, the top, to kind of explain what these graphs are, because <laughs> I know they kind of look uh, goofy. Uh, what we do at, here at Smart Harbor, actually, this top chunk, is we put in a list of keywords for individual agencies to see where they are ranking for specific terms. Um, and you can see over this little time series here, when we added that backlink, the jump in the rankings overall that we were showing up on in Google. Um, and you can see that is fairly sustained. You see that big jump right away, and then it kind of levels itself off. But compared to right before that big jump happens, you can see we're consistently showing up more, which, as I said before, huge part of ranking in Google, so you can see the direct impl implications here. Um, and then even in physical overall traffic, you can see now you might be thinking, well, this can't all just be because Google's ranking you higher. You're right. Um, that backlink is getting a lot of foot traffic to it. So the act of people clicking on that link and then also the fact that you're ranking higher uh, is causing a, a big jump in sustained traffic over time too, which is, which is awesome. Yeah. All right, thanks, Patrick. Let's jump to right end then to enhancing community queues. Sure. <laughs> so this, this is our second, uh, second little chunk here, and this is, um, I think this is probably the easiest to tie into branding organically. It's the easiest to kind of understand your agency brand, your even your personal professional brand uh, has a lot to do with how you interact and how you're viewed in the community. As a lot of you know, as local agencies, that's a big deal for you, as I, I imagine. <laughs> um, there's two big chunks that we want to focus on here, and they're social media and on your website. Um, both of which tie into SEO, obviously. That's, they're both extremely important in, in getting you found online. So um, the first thing we'll cover here is, is social media. So um, over on the right, you can see an example post that I'm, that I'm using here as a, as a community, localized, um, community-focused post. So it's about one of our agents. Um, uh, his, his son got married. Son works at the agency as well. They did a little post about it. Um, and performance-wise, it performed extremely well. Down at the bottom there, you can see 250% um, more than a typical post on their account. Um, obviously, that's going to depend on your uh, your follower numbers and your your you know brand that you've already built on social. Um, and if we, you know there are probably a few of you out there that are going, okay, great, who cares? It's social media. It's not really driving any business for me. Um, that month, the month that he, we posted that, March of 2017 you can see almost a 500% increase in Facebook traffic to the website from the year previous, March of 2016. So that's kind of the proofs in the pudding there. And then you might also be thinking before we, uh, before we skip on, um, what, what does this mean? Like, how do I do this? What is a community post? Um, if you think of social media as your, um, your community, marketplace, your community chat room, basically. What, what are you doing in the community? What, what's going on in the life of your agency or of you? And talking about that, staff birthdays, um, events and trips that you go on for the business. I don't know, if we're using the example from earlier with agriculture, maybe you're visiting different farms, assessing needs for different farmers, um, and weddings like this example shows, and, and anything in between. So our next point, uh, talking about on the website. So um, really, same as with social, anything you do in the community, especially if it's something that's recurring, can be a great focal point for the website, not just to help you to rank, but actually to drive traffic in and around the site. So this, uh, this example that we're looking at here is a, uh, essentially the agency sponsors 5Ks and 10Ks around the state. Um, and they have a website or a web page on their website dedicated to housing the information, results, talking about when the next races are, et cetera. And you can see 
on this, this specific web page, it's in their top three pages visited. Um, for the past three years, so there's some sustained performance to that page. It's almost 8% of their total traffic on their website, and that's including the home page, which generally on most websites is, you know, anywhere from 95 to 97% of your traffic is so always going to be on your home page, so it's driving a large amount of traffic. Um, an average of almost seven minutes on that page per user, which is crazy big. Usually we try to hit on average anywhere from 50 seconds to on the really, you know, high side two minutes. Um, so that seven minutes is, is really, really helpful. And then 26% uh, bounce rate, which a bounce is when somebody goes to the page and then leaves immediately, which means that only 20, only about a quarter of the people getting to this page are leaving right after they get to it. And the act of engaging people on this web page is what's helping that site rank because as I, as I talk about many times, you could have the most SEO optimized site in the world. If nobody's going to it already, it's still probably not going to rank. So when you can get people to your site, to stay on your site, that's going to help more than almost anything else you can optimize on your, on your web page. All right, let's jump into reinforcing mobile usability. So this is an interesting quote from Search Engine Land. Google will create and rank its search listings based on the mobile version of content, even for listings that are shown to desktop users. So what this is demonstrating, or at least validating, is the fact that you have more and more consumers that are leveraging mobile devices in order to be able to pull up content. So you want to make sure that your presence and your brand is adapting to this movement um, to more of a mobile-friendly uh, environment. And so from a mobile usability perspective, Patrick, if you could speak to us a bit about guided experience and what that means from a data perspective. Yeah, so uh, doing some testing on some of our more mobile-first designs, um, you can see here 11% more keywords showing on page one for Google as compared to um, our other sites that maybe are not as mobily focused, uh, which, is, which is a pretty big jump. Uh, and that kind of speaks to where Google's going. It speaks to where the other search engines are going since they, of course, piggyback off of Google. Um, and then that second point, which is a little bit harder to visualize, so I'll do my best, <laughs> is um, on average sites, so sites that we have moved from a less mobile experience to a more mobile experience have seen an increase, or an 11% greater increase in visits and a 14% greater increase in rankings over time than our sites that have stayed on a maybe 50-50 or less mobile-focused desktop. So it's pushing the needle not just statically, but it's causing a greater return over time. And this is just kind of an example. Uh, we can see, I, we just took it, an, old, an older website that we've recently upgraded to one of our more mobile uh, focused websites. So just a quick visual of what it used to look like versus what it looks like now. And then it's a very quick time series of actual, of, of the users showing up on that website post pre and post updates. You can see it with the little arrow when we switch the template. Um, you can see what is, will almost always happen is New website, ooh, often awesome. there's a bunch of people that hit the site uh, right in the next, you know, time frame, then it evens itself out a little bit, and then you can see the growth starting to happen post-template change at the end there. So, Patrick, I'm going to throw a question at you. So, regardless of, of who's providing the, the technology and the, the, the sites themselves, what does it mean to be mobile-friendly, and can you describe um, – Using this example, what is it that is happening that makes the consumer be able to view this on their device and be able to navigate through it better? Sure. Uh, so there's there's kind of a two prong answer to that. Um, there's a there's a the the coding half, <laughs> the logistical half, and then there's the um, user experience half. So the coding half is is basically as technology evolves, as the search engines evolve, um, we want to constantly be updating with how to actually code the website, how to make it what's called mobile responsive, which means when you go from a big screen size, that's probably not a, a mobile device, it displays in a desktop version. When you load that page on a small screen, that's probably a mobile device, and it slims it down Loads it, loads it in different ways and makes it easy to navigate and changes essentially the design to a more mobile, um, more mobile view. Now the other side, the actual, 
the actual um, user experience, the visualization side is actually all about design. So as Google evolves and they tell us and they you know tell the industry what they're looking at as mobile friendly, um, it's prioritizing images, prioritizing your top content, prioritizing call to action. So you can see the get a quote button moves to the middle. The banner is much bigger, it's much more engaging. Um, the the prior for for instance for this agency prioritizing the carriers he works with um, right below that and that all encompassing makes it a more mobile friendly website. Okay, so now moving into producing quality content. This is a search engine land, and I we like to reference search engine land when we can because it's a good publication around keeping best practices in mind, specific to things like digital marketing and here. SEO. So this is a periodic table of SEO success factors, and it's trying to, as best as it can, break down on-page factors for ranking and off-page factors for ranking. And then when you look kind of in the middle, you'll see the on-the-page SEO in blue and the off-the-page SEO in green. And as you move your eyes down vertically, you'll start to see where the colors of green and blue start to bleed into more pink and red. And so from a just quick visual perspective, these are all of the ranking factors that help determine where a site is going to place within a search engine. And when we're talking about this section and talking about content, you can see that the factors include quality, research, words, the freshness of your pages, the vertical that you're, you're going after, the specific FAQs that you might have that are wrapped in, the answers, and then what you want to avoid, for instance, would be very thin content, which is that BT, which starts to get pink. Um, I would encourage everybody, you literally can make a, perform a search on the periodic table of SEO success factors. This is updated almost every year, um, and it starts to include things that you see on the right, which would be social, et cetera, that we're talking about becoming important. You'll start to probably see more voice search and semantic pop up here when it comes to the type of content that you're building out. But this is a nice visual representation of all the little intricacies that go into SEO. Um, and then, you know, unfortunately, search engines don't tell you which one is uh, the top performer and if you focus on it, because you can see here there's, there's weights to each one of them. And then once you think you have that formula figured out, there's a change to the algorithm just to keep you guessing it on your toes. That's why it's important to be part of an industry like insurance where there's information that's aggregated up and enough to say these are the trends that we should follow uh, when trying to get ourselves out there locally as an insurance agency. So this is uh, this next guy. This is a, a big built-out example of what quality content can look like. Um, and this this agency focuses very heavily in marijuana insurance out on the West Coast. That's a big emerging market for a lot of people. Um, and and I also want to, as we're go going through this, I want to make sure that we think quality content is not just the words on the page. That's a very large part of it. But when you think about content, you also want to think about things like rich media. Um, about forms, different, maybe even chat widgets, anything else you can get on the site to engage users, videos, yeah, um, is going to be is going to be quality content. So you can see how it's is built out. He's got his all his different products for his, the different states he's focused in. Um, he's got an FAQ page uh, over on the left there. You can see how it's how it's kind of displayed there. And then on the right, you can see this is like the main landing page, and it's it's, it's long. It's got a lot of stuff on it, but you can see a video. Um, it's got logos for uh, uh, agencies, organizations he's accredited with. It's got uh, pictures of staff members. It's got the, it's got titles and and content that we are talking about. Um, button for get a quote. It's got everything that you could possibly want. Um, and if we go to the next slide here, we can see that there's this is all also on that same page. You just can't see it because it's kind of in real time. Um, there's the quote form. Uh, you can see it's got on the on the very bottom of the quote form there's a little button for marijuana insurance. There's a chat on that page. There's also this little video of this lady that pops up when you go to the page, kind of explains a little bit about the product. Um, and this is kind of more what I talking what I was talking about earlier. All the different types of things that can be content. And then there's results here. So this is for this specific agency. Uh, you can see for, for the various queries that we're going to put in that where we're trying to rank um, marijuana insurance in either a state or a town and state, depending on what we're trying to rank for. 
Um, his main area is Washington. There are some of his service areas right below there. Um, and these are, these are not pages where he's showing up, these are positions. So this is all on the first page. Um, he's, you know, a single location. And this is, you know, if you were to Google um, marijuana insurance Alaska, he'd be on the second position for that. Well, depending, it changes every day, so he may not be there now. <laughs> but he may, be, he may be one, he may be three. He's around there, though. Um, but you can see the results for each one of these areas because we crafted the content for those specific keyword terms for all of those specific areas. And if you're sitting there thinking about uh, what does this possibly have to do with me, it, 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 to pull ourselves out and be more macro about it, it's really about niche uh, content, niche uh, product that you're providing that really makes you unique as an agency because you're all fighting for more of the commoditized transactional terms that are associated with personal lines, home and auto, um, even some of those bot policies where you're competing with InsureTech now um, that are all trying to rank for specific terms. You're, you're going to get what you can get uh, from that real estate, but what really makes you unique, and this agency is an example, and you all have something that you're focusing on. We've had people come in with beekeepers insurance, craft brewing insurance, the list goes on and on. It's taking some of those and elevating them within your content, your pages, and to have some of these elements baked in so that you can ultimately start to rank um, and perform. So complying with security, this is a big, bold statement and something that uh, Google Security Blog published, and it is specific to July 2018. So beginning in July 2018, with the release of Chrome 68, Chrome will mark all HTTP sites as not secure. Uh, we'll go into some of the, the, the specifics here in a moment, but just the quick takeaway is, you don't want to end up with a page that looks like this. And this is what's happened right now. It's not a standard until July 2018, but we've seen this pop up across sites no matter what industry. And this is basically showing that the connection is not private. Why does that matter? Because if a consumer is searching for product services in your location and you're coming up and you're, you do, do not have an SSL certificate, as easy as it sounds, your consumer can have this experience, which is telling them that you are not secure as a, uh, basically a vendor online. And so that starts to degrade the value you've built as a credible insurance agency. And it's unfortunate because it's something that, you know, a, a browser is deciding to do. But everyone typically follows suit, so we'll continue to see this streamline down, and we wanted to bring it to your attention now. So this is, we're going to, I'll try to keep it as untechnical as possible, um, but what, what does SSL, what does HTTPS, what does it mean? Uh, so SSL stands for Secure Socket Layer. Um, I won't go into the whole definition, but for our intents and purposes, um, when you look at a website, a lot of the times you'll see HTTP colon, two slashes, and then the web address. Um, or you'll see HTTPS colon, two slashes, the web address. It's that, that S that fit in there that is the difference between having a secure and not, not secure site based on this format. So what is the difference? What does that mean? Uh, very simple. These three, these three bullet points, um, it physically it changes what your web address looks like from the HTTP to the HTTPS. Um, it makes your web, website more secure. Um, and then importantly, well, as important as making your website secure, is it makes your domain more authoritative in Google's eyes and in the other search engine's eyes, which means getting this SSL certification on your domain will help you to rank higher. Um, now, not only that, but as far as branding goes, you obviously want to appear secure. You want to appear like an authoritative voice to your clients. They're entrusting you with covering them when something happens. So that's huge, I would imagine, <laughs> for insurance agents. Uh, and then as you can see on the bottom, that's what it looks like right now. This is when um, Google will data test that big giant warning on the first screen. Uh, a lot of the times it will just look like this. Um, that first domain over on the bottom left is non-SSL, uh, and the guy over on the right is SSL secure. So Patrick, I don't want to create pandemonium. And so <laughs> we just wanted to bring this to the attention, and I, I don't care who your vendor is. It's a pretty simple process. Yes. You just high level, what is it in the call? It's not a huge cost if you're doing it yourself, as far as I know. Um, we, if you have really in-depth questions about it, that's something you should definitely uh, chat us or email us um, 
at support at smartharbor.com about, and we can have our dev people look at it. Um, but as far as on our program, uh, we're in the process of making all of our sites SSL secure at no cost. Um, so that should be forthcoming, I believe, in the next couple of days or weeks. Well, it was less about that. I think it was, uh, I honestly think everyone on the call, it's like $100 or less. Yeah, it, it's definitely every domain not. provider. So yeah. I don't care who you're with, just have it taken care of. That's really what <laughs> we wanted to leave you with. Yeah. All right. So here's an SSL example that actually shows pre and post. Can you just pull yeah. on that? Yeah. So this is just, uh, just some more proof in the pudding. Um, this. The big graph right here over on the, the top left here, blue um, is post this SSL change for this one specific uh, case study. Orange is the year prior, so we're looking at similar time frames. Um, the big takeaway is over on the right there, there are the actual numbers. Green across the board, um, which is pretty cool. Uh, and so it's not, not only is it just affecting the rankings, but it's affecting the actual user activity that's showing up um, to the page, along with, uh, you know, of course, you always want to factor in there's other things happening on the internet, but you can see bounce rate reducing, you can see session duration going up, um, pretty much green across the board, which is, which is really, really good to see. Um, and then on the bottom there, specific to rankings, this is, this is not year over year, this is just the right pre-update to an SSL secure domain, and then post-update, and they've jumped. Math is hard, <laughs> but about 43 positions, 43 new keywords that weren't showing up on the first page of Google before that update now are, so it's helping them rank as well. All right, so outside of the five tip tricks around uh, things that you can do or have taken care of and then showing you some examples so that we just don't leave you with recommendations without results, uh, we did want to add one piece that's more of the on the horizon, although it's happening right now and companies are scrambling to make sure that they are entering this world of voice search properly. So just to give you some information, Local Search Association, this was in 2016, so the numbers have grown, but this was um, one uh, quip that we could find. The equivalent of 50 billion searches a month being performed by the voice search, that is a global representation, but it's important to know that. Um, because then we can start to dive into, so what about device types? And so half of smartphone users, according to Comscore survey, engage with voice technology on their device, and many of them use the feature habitually. One in two use voice technology on smartphones. One in three uh, voice technology users use voice technology daily. And, you know, you can think about this from the fact that you might be in your car and you need to quickly get from point A to point B. So those are things that we probably do a lot of right now. Um, but then you will start to ask yourself, you know, with, the, with just what we're doing from the car's perspective and our mobile phones, we've got this introduction of the Alexas of the world, the Google Homes, and so we wanted to po po point out that the smart speaker sales have grown 300% in 2017, 24 million globally, um, says Strategy Analytics, and this is just a quick bar graph representation to demonstrate the 4X growth in the matter of a year around number of smart speakers that are shipped um, to homes across the globe. And so then you might say, well, that's great. I understand it, especially from uh, tailoring this for more of a uh, buying experience when we think about Amazon, Walmart, et cetera, but how does it apply to insurance? I performed a quick search here in Columbus, Ohio, and I was just trying to see uh, basically insurance carriers and then Amazon Alexa and wanted to see what I would get as far as a result, and it's pretty telling. We see farmer's insurance referenced here, nationwide insurance. Uh, we see um, Liberty Mutual. We see Grange Insurance. These are all carriers that are applying um, uh, new wave, either technology, content development, or just making sure that uh, their agency channels, their products are being indexed by these smart devices so that when you're in your home and you have a question, um, you're able to get to your carrier and your local insurance agency pretty quickly. So there's a trend here, and I just wanted to really just pull a, a search to demonstrate the news that surrounds it, especially from the insurance perspective, and then attending uh, local associations. I listen to many carriers just stand up and talk about what they're doing, and we believe that there's an opportunity for insurance agents who are 
are being driven by local business, people sitting in their homes that have a claim that they need to file or have in their head that they're buying a home so they need to go get home insurance or, you know, they just were told that in order to be able to fulfill a contract from a contractor's perspective, I need to have a certain liability coverage. So these are things that people are engaging their devices for to have conversations and the market and the industry is playing heavily into that. Yeah, so here are some, these are just kind of some tactical, well, what do we do about this? <laughs> how, do we, how do we optimize for voice search? Because it's going to be different. It's like when mobile phones started having internet browsers on them. Things, things change, things update, so we need to keep pace. So um, un, did your understanding how voice search will probably affect Google rankings, affect how we update sites, affect how we optimize. So understanding voice search queries is first bullet point. So vernacular, geographic, and demographic information in certain areas. So if someone in your area, for instance, maybe they maybe they you know use landmarks when they're talking because when when people when people use voice search, they're less likely to formulate a total thought and type it into an actual bar somewhere. Um, a lot of the times we'll run into this in more rural areas, people referring to counties as where they are instead of a town. So if that might apply to you, if you know, for instance, somewhere in your area, they, they usually refer to yourself like here in Columbus if we, we don't generally, at least in at least in my circle of friends, <laughs> use it Franklin County as where we are, but if that is kind of how we, people in that area refer to themselves, that's something you optimize for. Um, think about, this is more of the same, but the difference between type and voice, how people do this, and, and this is some, some of these actual uh, things that they're finding when they do surveys, but um, store hours versus for voice, when is blank, so when is maybe like McDonald's open? Um, searching for areas by name instead of for voice, uh, find me an insurance agency near me. Because as a voice searcher, you know you know that the phone knows where you are <laughs> or, or Alexa knows where you are. Um, 30 times more likely uh, to be an action query versus type search. So an action search is give me the hours that McDonald's is open, give me something. You're, you want the, the thing, you want Alexa to perform an action um, versus just asking a simple question or versus typing in, not, not a, for typing in just a phrase to a, a search bar. Um, and then more longer tail keywords. The people using voice are going to be more conversational than when you type anything in. That's how people work. That's why, that's why it's hard to get sarcasm out of a uh, comment section in Twitter. <laughs> um, and then people will be looking for general info and more information when they talk versus when they type. So, Back in that, uh, that content example that I gave you, we looked at there's a, one of those pages that we built out was an FAQ page. Those are things that are going to become more and more important because people are going to just be asking questions that they want answers to as opposed to look, going out and looking for specific information. It's going to be more general and it's going to be more, um, more long tail, more conversational. So basically your optimization has to be more conversational. Exactly. Okay. All right, so we're going to conclude there with the thank you page, and it has our contact information, but now we're going to go to some of the questions that we've received um, from agents that are on the line. So give us one quick second, and we're going to pull up the chat. We do have some chats coming through. All right, first one is optimizing for keyword specific to product and location is what we're used to. Has that changed? So, yeah, it has and it hasn't. Um, the, the big change, the concept, the general concept around optimizing um, for, for specific keywords, for specific products, for specific locations, that is all essentially the same. That's how the search engines work. They go out based on a query, so, so that query has keywords in it, and they look for sites with those keywords in the site. So the, the game changer here is because um, we're transitioning specifically for voice search, we're transitioning to a more conversational and a more um, nuanced approach. It's basically that at a grander scale. So we want to make sure we're optimizing. Um, you know, people may not be, and this has even kind of been the same with type search, but if you're looking for snowmobile insurance, 
it's optimizing a page for not just recreational vehicle insurance. You want to have a page about snowmobiles. You want to have a page about how to insure them, what to worry about, tips for fixing them. Because people are going to be asking all of these different questions, and we want to make sure that we're optimizing for each thing in tandem so we can rank for all of those different keywords that get asked or typed. All right, next one is I refer to brands usually as logo, color palette, voice, messaging. Why aren't you focusing on that as opposed to digital tactics? I think the I think the big uh, concept here is that the, those uh, you know brand logos uh, how how stuff looks um, that's that's a part of this definitely but it's kind of just scratching the surface as far as your brand goes so um, your brand online as well as offline but is how you appear to people so how your site looks how it's structured um, what different you know like like for instance whether it's secure or not that kind of stuff is going to be part of your brand, how you interact with people on social media. That's a huge part of your brand. So it's, it's taking that and then kind of like the, the first question, it's taking that two or three steps further than and building out an entire brand around your agency and yourself. Thank you. Uh, second to last here, how do online reviews factor into this presentation that we just gave? So um, <laughs> for those of you that some of you probably were, uh, came to one of the um, webinars about reviews. That's kind of why I chose to not talk too crazy much about it because <laughs> you got droned on enough. But um, reviews are, are very big. They probably fit in mostly uh, in this presentation in our community queues section. So reviews are actually can be a very important part of branding. If you have a lot of positive reviews, if you're you know a, a big five star all over the place, Google, Facebook, Yelp has five star reviews. Um, and you see not only that, but you are an agency that people can see are responding to positive reviews or responding to negative reviews. You're taking care of your customers online. That's a huge part of branding. That shows people what you're about, and it helps them to understand how you interact with at least the community of your current customers, let alone the community uh, at large. Thank you. And then last one, just to make sure, I don't see any others coming through. Um, so I just checked my site managed by Smart Harbor. When will it be SSL compliant? Good question. It is. The HTTPS exists currently. And then the site itself, uh, or the SSL compliance is being pushed next week. Um, in anticipation of July, we wanted to get out in front of it first. But thanks for the question. Um, thanks. Yeah, I won't reveal the name, but thank you for the question. <laughs> it's a good one. Um, so are there any other questions, comments that uh, anyone has on the line today? If not, you can always reach out to us. That's why we left the backdrop up for our contact information. Uh, we'd love to talk to you. Uh, but hopefully, if nothing else, you were able to glean some information today and might be able to apply uh, uh, some of these recommendations to your web assets, et cetera. So with that, we'll sign off. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful rest of your week.